Amen. God bless you as you find your way back to your seats. I uh, was rejoicing today um, over the freedom that the gospel gives us. Uh, that that I, I don't have to be performance driven enough to preach a sermon about the Super Bowl. There's freedom in that. That we can just open up the Bible and act like we're at church. Right? Because we are. And that, and that God can be our God and that we can just celebrate together the goodness of His Word. And so I'm excited about this. Uh, we're going to be launching into Matthew chapter 8 today. So if you want to grab your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, that's where we will begin. Wow, that was really loud. I apologize. Uh, we're going to be reading the first four verses of Matthew chapter 8. This is what it says. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you do not tell anyone but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So we're just going to kind of walk through this uh, passage of Scripture today. I want us to explain this passage of Scripture so that we're all on the same page, so that we have an understanding of this passage of Scripture, because I believe that our understanding of this will impact the way that we apply it. And so before we get to the application part, I want us to get through the understanding part so that we have a, a true read as to what is taking place. What happens a lot of times is that we break down scriptures when we walk through uh, sermons the way that we do and, and books of the Bible the way that we do is uh, we forget kind of where we are in the context of the rest of the, of the book around us. And so um, how many of you have slept since last Sunday? So that's all of us. So sometimes, you know, when you sleep, you, you, you unprocess things that you've processed. And so if we just start in chapter 8 and just start reading, it's easy for us just to continue moving forward and to never look backward. Except that for us to have an understanding as to what's taking place, we actually have to look backward. It, it starts off by saying when Jesus came down from the mountainside. Well, he wasn't camping. He, he wasn't hiking, right? He wasn't playing hide-and-seek with his disciples. He's just finished the Sermon on the Mount, which is three chapters of the Bible. And he's just completed what is this modern marvel of preaching. He's given us what is the largest recorded sermon of his that we have in Scripture. And he's just finished this moment. And he's coming down the mountainside. And the Bible says that a leper approaches him and meets him as he's coming down. So we don't know how many people were present at the Sermon on the Mountain. We, we do have um, different numerical references as we walk through events in Jesus' life. But this is not one of those events where we have a numerical reference. So we do not know how many people were there. In the, the first verse of chapter 5, it says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up onto the mountainside to teach them. That word that we have there for crowds in the Greek language, it literally means multitude or large groups of people. So it's a multitude of people. There were throngs of people that were gathered together. It was enough people to make him decide that he needed to elevate himself up on a mountain to give himself some natural acoustics so that his voice would carry, so the large crowd could hear him as he preached the Sermon on the Mount. And it's in the midst of this, there is a large crowd that is, they were just amazed at his preaching. They were amazed. They were in awe of him at the fact that he preached and he taught as one who had authority. And they're following him as he leaves the mountain, he comes down from the mountainside, and this large crowd of people is following Jesus. So it's not like um, Jesus is out in front, and the large crowd just kind of go wherever he is. It's like this throng of people that are just kind of moving along. 
And in the midst of all of that, you can probably picture this in your mind, a leper starts walking through the middle of the crowd. And the crowd begins to part because leprosy was viewed as very contagious. Now, we know that leprosy could have been any skin condition and still fallen under the category of leprosy, but it also included leprosy, which would make parts of your body fall off. It's bad news, Jay. So if you if you scratched your arm and it, sw- it got all swollen and nasty looking and it had some kind of an infection, everyone would be like, whoa, that's leprosy, man. Get back away from me. I don't want my fingers falling off. I don't want to do life without my toes. And so everything was very uh, pushed to the side. The, the, the lepers, they had their own communities that were outside of the major communities. They were not allowed inside the normal communities. They were not allowed to interact with society at large. And when they came into a group, the law required that they announce their presence. So they had to yell, unclean, unclean, as they walked through the crowd so that everyone would know, hey, this guy has leprosy, let's get away from them. And in the midst of all of this, this guy just parts the crowd because he wanted to get to Jesus. I assume it's a guy. I'm going to reference it. As if it's a guy, it could have been a girl. We don't know. The leper just parts the crowd, just walks through the crowd because he's trying to get to Jesus. So people are probably, you know, grabbing their kids and like yanking them away. And they're, they're, the, part, the, 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 the sea of the crowd of people is parting, if you will, as he makes his way to Jesus. This socially unacceptable individual was freely engaging society because he knew that whatever repercussion that might come with was worth the risk to get to Jesus. As we walk through this passage of Scripture, we're going to learn both from Jesus and from the leper. What we learn, what we learn from the leper is that when you need Jesus, you should not allow the people that are around you to prevent you from getting to Jesus. What we see in a lot of scenarios is um, the sort of the follow the leader mentality of, well, man, you know, I really, I really need something, but, but you know, they're not letting me, or man, I really want to engage in worship, but no one else around me is, or man, I really just want to speak out, the the gifts of the Spirit are on me, and I I really, I just want to, I want to go, I'm supposed to go pray for that person, but then we don't. I've got this word of encouragement for this fellow believer, I need to call them and check on them and and speak this word of encouragement, but but what if they, you know, what if they reject it, what if they, and we let this fear of what the people around us will do prevent us from doing what we're supposed to do with Jesus. But the leper didn't. The leper knew that if he walked through the crowds of people, there could be some repercussions. He knew that he knew that he would have jeers. He knew that people would say things. He knew that it would be hurtful emotionally. He knew that people would run from him. He knew that that there would there's even the possibility if he's not announcing his presence, which we don't have record of him doing that. There's even this this threat of punishment legally from him breaking the laws of the land. But he knew throw me in prison, but first let me see Jesus. Mock me if you will, but I need Jesus. And he didn't allow the people around him to prevent him from getting to Jesus. Here's what we learn from Jesus. The crowd around the leper would have fled. And yet Jesus stood his ground. He wasn't following the crowd around him either. He didn't shrink back. He engaged. 
what we learn from him is when you have the mind of Christ, you don't have to follow the crowd. When you have the mind of Christ, you can recognize this is an opportunity for the God of glory to be seen and for the kingdom of God to be advanced. What would it have looked like if Jesus goes up on the mountainside and preaches a three-chapter sermon on if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, here is what it looks like. Here's how you interact with others. Here's how you interact with God. Here's how your interactions with others and your interactions with God play off of each other and impact each other. And then the first opportunity he has to live out his sermon, a leper comes he's like, whoa, man, I ain't trying to have that. What are you doing coming up here to me? I got six disciples over there somewhere. Why don't you go find them? But he knew. He knew because it was his kingdom. It was his rules. And it still is today. It's his kingdom. And we are his followers. And as his followers, when we have his mind, we don't have to do what the crowds around us are doing. We can engage community. We can engage society around us. We can engage the people that are hurting, that are lost, that are broken. And we can do it without fear. Because we know that God is leading us. So we see that the leopard, the leopard, not leopard, that's an animal. The leopard, the leopard, he didn't, he wasn't distracted by anyone else. He didn't allow anyone else to prevent him from getting to Jesus. And we see that Jesus, because he knew what was about to happen, he wasn't distracted either. He stood his ground. The leper kneels before Jesus and says, If you are willing, you can make me clean. The word that he used for willing means to decide and to act, or to purpose and to fulfill. There are two different words for willing in the Greek that we would translate as willing in in the English. One of them means to wish but not to do. One of them means to purpose and to fulfill. There's action that comes along with it. What he was proposing to Jesus, if you are willing, he's not just saying, I I mean, if you think about it, like, I mean, you know, I mean, whatever. I mean, it'd be cool, right? But I mean, you know, whatever. It's no big deal. What he was communicating was, you have the power to do this. It is within your ability to do this. It is within your character to do this. You have authority over my leprosy, and if you choose to leverage your authority for my benefit, then I would like to be clean. The leper didn't want Jesus just to wish him well. He wanted Jesus to make him well. Again, we learn from Jesus and from the leper that too often Christians just wish those around us well when it is within our ability to move and to act and to make them well. We hear about needs, we see the needs of the people around us, and we just say, man, I wish them well. I I hope they get that figured out. Boy, man, yeah, I, I... Blessings on you, favor on you, and then we just move on with our life. But the one with the need, they're not looking just to be wished well, they're looking to be made well. What the leper was communicating was not, hey, would you just wish me well as you go? This wasn't, and we do see this in the scriptures where this happens, where people bring their children to Jesus. Not because they're sick or infirm, but because they wanted him as a teacher to bless them on his way. And he did. He took the time to to gather the children to him. To pass blessing over them. 
this was a different deal. This wasn't just, hey, would you just wish my kid well? This was, hey, I, I, need, I need an interaction. I need a touch. I need healing. I need you to access your God power and do something on my behalf. If you're willing. If we're learning from Jesus, we will meet the needs of those that we see. When we see the needs of those around us, when we have something that can be done, we will engage the darkness around us. We don't shrink back from darkness. We, we don't view society and get scared or disappointed or frustrated or angry. We view society and we see them as lost. We see them as in darkness and in need of the light of the gospel. And we engage. If we're learning from the leper, you'll have the same desire for Jesus to move for us. If we're learning from the leper, then when we approach Jesus with our needs, what we're doing is we're acknowledging His God authority. We're humbling ourselves under that God authority, and we're saying, God, if you're willing, if you will do this, I know that you can. I know that it is within your authority, within your power, within your nature, within your character, and if you would leverage that for this need. And we have this desire for God to move to where we can actually see Him at work. Not just to, to rest in, ah, oh, well, you know, I mean, you know, God's always doing stuff right, so I mean, it'll work out. Ah, uh, God's sovereign, so I mean, if they're supposed to die impoverished and starving, maybe tonight's their night. Disappointed for man once, you know. But to see God move in a tangible way, okay, here's the need, and I can meet this. The, word, the words that we translate as make and clean, when the leper says, you can make me clean, are actually the same word. So what he's actually saying is, you can clean me clean. Lord, if you're willing, you can clean me clean. This is a, a word that had become used for being cleansed of leprosy, but it also had a legal and a ritual connotation to it as well. So he wasn't just saying, hey, God, I would like to be clean. He knew that when he was cleansed from leprosy, that there would be this ritualistic and legal reintegration into society. It went beyond just physical healing. It went into social healing. It went into relational healing. It went into the way that he was interacted with by society and the way that he was allowed to interact with society around him. It wasn't just like, okay, well, okay, all the, all the former lepers, you have to sit over here. You never know if you're going to start breaking out in leprosy again. We want to be sure that it's contained if it does. And yet sometimes as Christians, isn't that, don't we view people by their past mistakes? Under the church system that was in place at this time, a person wasn't really clean unless a priest had pronounced them clean. I mean, they could be completely healthy, completely whole, but until a priest signed off on that, they weren't allowed back into community. The leper was identifying Christ's authority to pronounce him as clean. What he was communicated, just in his words, what he was communicated is, you are the high priest, higher than our high priest. That because of your God nature, this is within your nature, your power, your character, your authority, and beyond that, your place as priest of my life, as the prophesied Messiah, you can make this pronunciation. You can pronounce me clean. Jesus reaches out 
and touches the man. He says, I am willing to be clean. Using the same word that the man had just used, which is basically Jesus saying, yes, I do have that authority. Yes, this is my nature. This is my character. Yes, I am God. And as God, I do have priestly authority to pronounce you clean. This was like a secret conversation that was taking place between the leper and Jesus. We read this in the English, and we see a leper asking to be healed. But when we look at this in the connotations of the original language and understanding what's actually being communicated, what's really being communicated is the leper coming up and saying, Jesus, you're God. And him saying, yes, I am. The leper saying, because you're God, you can do this. And Jesus saying, God just touched you. And because God touched you, be clean. Again, we, we learn here from Jesus and, and the leper. For learning from the leper, sometimes before any God-sized thing can happen in our lives, we have to acknowledge that Christ has authority over whatever it is that needs the God-sized thing to happen. A lot of times what happens is we will say, oh yeah, God's bigger than fill in the blank. Well, I know God's bigger than that. Yeah, God's bigger than cancer. God's, God's bigger than broken relationships. God's, big, God's bigger than a, a, a child that's not living for Jesus. God's bigger than my boss being a jerk. God's bigger than my need for provision. God's bigger than whatever it is. We say that. But a lot of times we say it because we're supposed to say it. If, if the leper had done what he was supposed to do, he never would have seen Jesus. Because he wasn't supposed to walk through a crowd of people. A lot of times we just do it because we're supposed to do it. And there's no real understanding of the authority of Christ. There's no real humbling of ourselves beneath the authority of Christ. And because there's no real humbling of ourselves under the authority of Christ, we don't see Christ move. Before Jesus did anything, which, again, if you walk through the Gospels and we'll see some of this stuff, Jesus just stops at random and does miracles for people where they had no idea He was coming. They have no idea who He is. And it's all because of just who He is. We see a story in the Gospels where a, a, a young man had died and uh, had left his mother, uh, who was a widow, with no recourse, with no one to provide for her. And just as Jesus is just walking by, not even invited to the funeral, walking by, stops and raises that young man from the dead. He wasn't asked to. There was no uh, submission to his authority. There was no, oh, you are God. There was none of those moments. It's just him doing what he wanted to do. So we do have those moments. But a lot of times, uh, what you see in Scripture is that those times are few and far between. Usually when you see a miraculous something happen, it's because someone came to Jesus in humility and submitted themselves to the authority of Christ. And if we're not willing to submit ourselves to the authority of Christ, then the, the amount of what we see God do will be limited by our own pride by our lack of humility. Immediately, the now former leper was clean. Then we get to the part of the Scripture that, to me, as I read it, makes no sense. Remember, these two are not alone. Like, it's easier for us to read this and just picture it as Jesus and the leper. But, 
in context, he's just come down from a mountainside with throngs of people. The, the crowd has parted around this leper, waiting to see how Jesus will interact with him. They are on display for all to see, and there is a multitude of people around them that just watch Jesus break every social conduct rule, reach out his hand, physically touch a leper, pronounce him clean, and him be healed on the spot. A large crowd of people just saw this. And Jesus says, hey man, if you could just like kind of keep this on the down low. I don't really want people finding out about this. So, I mean, you know. Like, what sense does that make? Everyone was going to know. So what was really being communicated in that? Just like there was a secret conversation where a leper comes to Jesus and says, hey, I think you're God. And because you're God, you could do this. And Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him and says, yes, I am God and I will do that. There was more being said. What we see when we look at this in the original language is that Jesus is giving the lepers three do's and a don't. In verse 4, it says, Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest. Offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Our words, see that, are actually just one word in the Greek. And that word is usually in Scripture translated as perceive or understand. This is the first view. The leper comes to Jesus and says, hey, I think you're God. And he says, I am God. And he proves that he is God. And his first command is, get it. Perceive. Understand what just happened. Perceive. Perceive that you brought nothing to the table but your leprosy. But because of your interaction where God touched you, where God moved in your presence, where you had a meeting face-to-face with God in the flesh, you are leaving whole as a restored member of community. Get what just happened. Understand that this was not just some random miracle. Understand that this was an encounter with a personal God. Saying, perceive, get it, understand, get it. You see, what we see a lot of times is God move in ways that only God can move, and then man taking credit for it. The leper didn't go away and say, Man, did you see the way I parted that crowd? I'm a force to be reckoned with. Jesus knew that man better heal me. I'd have wrapped my leper body all over him. No. He was humble. He humbled himself in the presence of Jesus. He didn't take the credit for anything. He knew that he showed up a leper and left not a leper. branding and marketing and all these different things. I think that they're tools to be used, but um, I get, I don't know, I get real nervous when um, when we're asking people to come be prayed for and our logo is on the screen behind me. As if our church is anything. get real nervous for churches when we hear them announce their latest campus that's opening up in whatever community and start talking about that in terms of this community has never heard the gospel until we're there. They're in complete darkness in that community. Every church there is ineffective and unproductive, but our church is awesome. And wait till we get there. People will be saved. And we can't take the credit for 
credit for what only Jesus can do. Jesus says, I will build my church. It's his job. It's not our job. Our job is to faithfully gather together as the body of believers, as saints have done for thousands of years, and to worship our Savior and to make his glory known in the lives of those around us. That's our job. And it's so much easier than placing the weight of church growth and health and image all on our shoulders. To just simply say, God will be God. And wherever we are, we're going to make sure that God gets to be God. And that as we do that, we see God do the things that only He can do in our lives. And this isn't just church growth, this is us as individuals as we live our lives in humble submission to God, letting Him be God. Then we see Him do things in our lives that, that would not otherwise be possible. The first thing He says is, see that. I wish there was a comma there. Because I think that's more accurately represents what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, see that you don't tell anyone. He's saying, see that. Understood you. Don't tell anyone, but see that. Get it. Perceive it. Understand it. I am God. Now, don't tell anyone that I'm God. They have to figure it out on their own. Because his time wasn't fully completed yet. If they knew he was God, they'd have killed him then. But in that context, in that moment, with that lever, he's saying, hey, get this, understand it, perceive it. Now, don't tell anyone. This wasn't about the act of healing. This is about the revelation of Jesus as God. To see that. Then he says, don't tell anyone. Here's the don't. He already had to do, get this, understand this, perceive this. Then he has a don't. Don't tell anyone. So Jesus also knew that in this arena, that certain prophecies will be fulfilled. And he even talks about some of those prophecies when he says this generation will be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. And he knew that it wouldn't be his last miracle, that he would continue to do miracles and the people would know it. In fact, part of the miracle of the water being turned to wine that happened at a wedding in Cana, part of that, the miracles that he'd already been performing is why there was a multitude of people around him as he preached this Sermon on the Mount. It was because of the miracles. He wasn't saying, don't tell people I'm doing miracles. He was saying, hey, I'm going to be revealing myself to people and I need them to get it. So you got it. Great. But for right now, leave it there. Then he goes on with two more do's. Show yourself, go show yourself to the priest. Offer the gift that Moses commanded. See, again, before he could be really clean, a priest had to pronounce him clean. He was telling Jesus, you're that priest, you can make me clean, you can do this. And Jesus said, yes, I can. And then he said, okay, but for everyone else that doesn't get it. I need you to go show yourself to the, to the priest, to the local priest. I need him to pronounce you clean for everyone else's sake. You're clean. Be clean. You're clean. We're good. But do this for everyone else. Because this will help them. And then he says this. Offer a gift that is prescribed by Moses. The word that Jesus used there for gift doesn't have anything to do with fulfillment of the law. See, if we know anything about the history of the law, then what we see is that if you are, if you're present, when you go to see the priest, if you're presenting your, your offering to the Lord, then he will tell you, oh, this was your sin, okay, this is what's prescribed by the law. You need two pigeons, or, oh, that was a bad sin. You need a big bull, so go find you one of those. Ah, that's, you know, we see that three times a day, so it's a goat for you. Bring the goat in, and this is kind of how the legal system works. 
And if there were a, a healing that were to take place, then they would have to offer this gift to the Lord, this sort of a, a celebratory gift to the Lord, and the priest would be able to say what that gift was going to be. So, so really, we could read this in English and say, Hey, that was just Jesus saying, hey, listen, go go do the stuff you're supposed to do now. Go straight up to the priest. Let him pronounce you clean. Offer the gift. Be good there. And that will help everybody. But that's, that's not the word that Jesus used. It had nothing to do with the fulfillment of the law. It had everything to do with resourcing for ministry. So what he's doing is he's saying, hey, there's going to be a priest. And these priests need to know me just like everyone else needs to know me. And so don't, don't be distracted by everyone here. What I want you to do is I want you to go to the priest. He, he, he brings this leper in. He gives him access and revelation. He changes his life instantaneously through healing. There's this revelation. There's this communion with God where, where he says, I think you're God. Jesus says, I am God. You could say at that moment, that was the salvation moment for the leper. Jesus heals him from his infirmity and then immediately recruits him to ministry by saying, the priests are going to be your people group. You're going to go to the priest. And here's how you're going to reach them. You're going to take this gift that's going to help them do the job that I've given them to do. They have need. There's need at the, at the temple. And you can fill that need just like you had need. And I helped you with your need. You're going to see their need, and that's going to be your, your avenue. As you meet their need, they're going to give you a voice into their life, and you're going to be able to share what I have done for you to them as a testimony to them. That's the word that Jesus used, as a testimony. That word testimony, it literally means a telling of God's work. Some of you are old enough to remember the testimony services. I'm a skeptic. I always wondered when I was growing up if the pastor just didn't have time to write another sermon, and so he just kind of got there and was like, someone testify. And that worked out great for him. He's like, man, that worked out great. We'll do that once a month. I don't, I don't know. But testimony, it's, it's a literal telling of God's work, and it's from a first-hand, a first-hand account. It's not like, man, I was reading this story about a missionary in India the other day, and here's what he said in that awesome. It's a first-hand telling of, I was this, God was this, and now God did this. So what he was doing with the leper was he was taking him out of his leprosy and into community and putting him on mission to where he would understand, you have a mission and your mission is the priest. And you're going to go impact the life of the priest and you're going to keep doing it. This This is what was being communicated. Yes, I am God. And because I am God, you get to do this. Here's your mission. Here's your role. Here's your part in my kingdom. That's what Jesus was saying. I think as we look to apply this, the order of events is useful knowledge for us. I think a lot of times as, as Christians, um, we come to God with expectations instead of coming to God with humility. And um, and when we do that, we, we have the tendency to get the order of operations a little bit wrong. This is how we see the order of events as it took place in this story. Um, the first thing that happened was the leper made a humble request, recognizing the authority of Christ, elevating Christ to the, to the status of God and saying, you're God and I'm not. And as he did that, as he moved into the presence of Jesus, simply to, to elevate Jesus, that's when God was able to do something. Sometimes we're guilty of, okay, God, if you're God, And let me tell you where we see that. From the devil when he's tempting Jesus. 
if you're the Son of God. Throw yourself off this. So we can either come in humility or we can come like the devil. When we start making demands and we start making commands and we start having these expectations saying, alright God, you're going to do this or else. Or else what? He's God. He spoke everything into existence. He can speak you into non-existence. This is, has nothing to do with anything, but the way my mind works is terrible sometimes. Have you ever wondered, I don't know if I should or not, that's wisdom from my wife. Have you ever wondered if there's like things that God does that like we're not even aware of? I mean, I, you know that's the case, right? But like, is it like, oh man, this person was so evil and bad and terrible that God just made him disappear and be, like straight to eternity with hell. And then because he's God, he like erased everyone's memory of that person. So like we would never be like, oh, where's, where's, where's Billy? We haven't seen Billy in a while. We just, so all of a sudden we just don't know that Billy's there and never remember Billy, but all of a sudden Billy's in hell for eternity because he was a bad guy. No? No one else? Just me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, that's neither here nor there. Sometimes as Christians, we're guilty of bringing Jesus our expectations. And that's not what the Bible instructs us to do. It says, make your request known to the Lord. Not make your demands known to the Lord. Not make your expectations known to the Lord. It's make your request. If you're making a request, it's, it's recognizing the authority of the other person to, to accept or deny the request. And how this whole ordeal started was him making a humble request. I don't know who that priest was. But man, I'd sure like to hear his story. Did he reject everything that the leper had to say? After Jesus' death and resurrection, was he one of the 3,000 that were saved on the day of Pentecost? If you read through the New Testament, you see that there were large numbers that were saved, even priests. Was he leading a, a revival in the priesthood? I don't know, but it all started with a humble request. And that's where we start to. When we approach Jesus, it has to be out of humility. The second thing that we see in the order of events is, is important for us. Jesus touches the leper. Before he responds, before he does anything, there was physical contact that was made. This leper might not have been physically touched by anyone in years. Jesus was meeting personal need. There is all kinds of science out now and research out now that says if you don't touch a baby enough, it changes that child for eternity. If we don't have physical contact with people, it changes our personality, it changes our mood, it changes the way that we interact with the world around us. So, before Jesus ever even said anything, he was already meeting me. Before he was cleansed of his leprosy, Jesus recognized and was already meeting needs. And when we come to God with humility, then as we look back, we're able to say, man, God was already working. Before I ever even realized I needed to pray for something, I didn't even see it coming, but God did. And look at everything that God was doing on the way. He reached out and he touched, he touched the person. Before, before we ask God to do a miraculous work, we should ask God to do a, a work inside of us. We pray for healing. We believe in healing. We pray for deliverance and believe in deliverance. We pray for restoration of relationships and we believe that God is a restorative God. We pray for the miraculous and we believe for the miraculous. But we can't be so void of God on the inside that we just walk around looking for some big show. Before we ever pray and press in for a miracle, we should be praying and pressing in for God to do something inside of us. 
And then when God is working inside of us, the miracle is something that flows from and through what God is doing inside of us. What Jesus was doing was in the proper order. He comes, and the leper comes and says, man, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, okay, but first let's do something inside you. You're saying you think I'm God? I'm God. Because I'm God. Now let's do something big. The leper made a humble request. Jesus touches the leper. Here's the next one. Then Jesus heals the leper. Some of you need to be healed of some things, and I'm not talking about just sickness. You've had events that have taken place in your life. You've got scars. You've got wounds. You've got some kind of an emotional something that's taken place. You've got resentment, hurt, uh, confusion. Some of you need to be healed. And I'm telling you, if you're just asking God for healing, it won't happen until you humble yourself and ask Him just to do a work inside you. Once you have allowed the work of God inside you, once Jesus has personally revealed himself to God in your circumstance, then he can do something big and say, okay, now be healed. But there's an order of operations. And we learn as we walk through this. Just looking for the next big thing. That's not what Jesus is about. He's a big God and he does big things. But he does big things after he's done the little things. Isn't this what he tells us? Those that wish to do big things must first be faithful in the little things. Why would he expect that of us if that's not the way that he works in us? Fourth thing. The leper made a humble request. Jesus touches the leper doing the little things. Jesus heals the leper doing the big things. And then Jesus immediately makes the work about others. He immediately makes the work about others. He says, listen, I have revealed myself to you. There's a priest that needs to hear this. He needs to hear your story. He needs to see the evidence. He needs to know. And you need to tell him. When, when Jesus has really done something in us, then we don't hoard the goodness of God. We don't create this shrine for people to come visit where God moved. Instead, we take the message of the goodness of God and we engage the world around us and we say, here's a person that needs to hear what God has done in my life. I'd like you to stand with me if you would. We're going to close our service in prayer. We're going to close our service in prayer believing that God will help us be humble and that as we approach Him with humility that we'll see Him be faithful in the little things, doing things in our personal lives and that as we're faithful to allowing His work in our personal lives that we'll, be, we'll, we'll, we'll see Him do the big things too. That we'll have relationships restored. That we'll have healings take place. That we'll have the miraculous at hand. And that we'll be able to take that to other people. But that won't be about us. And man, look what God did here, but it'll be about His mission, His kingdom, and advancing His work. Jesus, we praise You and we thank You for Your goodness to us. God, I pray that You would help us today. God, we need You to help us in Your presence. God, God, I pray that You would forgive us from the times that we've ever approached You with expectation or approached You with, with demands. God, I pray as we repent for that, I pray that you would take us to a deeper level of understanding you and how you work in our lives. God, I, I pray that you would help us. Help us just to walk humbly in your presence, acknowledging your authority over all. And God, as we walk in your authority, I pray that, that as we humble ourselves to you, that we would see you at work in our lives in ways that we never have. And God, because of your work that is fresh in our lives, I pray that we would begin to see you do things that we've never seen you do. And God, that you will submit this in us, that the work that we see is not just for us. God, help us to understand that our role 
is to honor you, to bring you glory, and to expand your kingdom. God, our heart is to live our lives for the expansion of your kingdom and the glory of your name. We ask you to help us. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen. Amen. Church, we love you guys. Don't forget, I sign up for the family table. We would love to see you this Wednesday as we eat together. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week.